Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome the participants and the audience of our meeting. And today, our discussion, the traditional culture 2.0, as part of the St. Petersburg Culture Forum. My name is Ilya Firapontov. I'm editor in chief of Science Online magazine N Plus One. And I'm going to moderate a discussion that has to do with my professional activities, uh, but it also has to do with a completely different field that I don't know too well, so it's going to be a great opportunity for me to learn something new from my guests. Uh, we're going to talk about science communication and the role the communicators can play for the cultural institutions or more particular for museums. What can the communicator in te technologies and methods of scientific communication can do uh, as they're becoming more and more popular in the scientific organizations and companies and the methods that allow us to uh, communicate. It's a complex of methods or jobs or skills. The task of which is to render to a wide audience the problems that the scientists are working on the scientific results and inform the public and get the scientists to meet the public. So let me introduce our participants. Today, we have Anna Klukina with us, director of the largest in Russia bio museum, the director of one of the largest museums overall in Russia, the State Darwin Museum, Nicholas Pineson, research geologist, curator of the fossil marine mammals at the one of the largest Saint, natural scientific museums of the United States, the Smith, Smith, Smithsonian. We got Mikko Milikoski. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. <laughs> CEO of the Finnish Saint Center, Eureka, who deals in the development of interactive and multimedia scientific projects. We got Vipke Rossig from Berlin, the research associate of the Natural History Museum in Berlin, and she works in new formats of interaction with the public. And we got Vyacheslav Klementov, deputy director for research from the Moscow Museum of Cosmonautics. And, I would, and it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say a unique museum, because nowhere else in Russia can you find such a collection of Russian and Soviet equipment and artifacts. Thank you all for joining us here today. My first question is fairly evident. Could you talk how do your organizations use the methods and technologies of scientific communications? Which place do they occupy? What do you do? How do these technologies appear? Where do you get them from? Where do you get this experience and how does it stay in your experience? I believe I'm going to ask Nicholas to start us off. No problem. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya, for the uh, introduction. I'm really happy to be joining everyone from, I'm actually inside my office at the Natural History Museum. Um, and uh, I wish I very much could be in St. Petersburg, uh, as I think a lot of the other participants uh, wish they could as well. Um, the Smithsonian is uh, a collection of about 20 different museums. Uh, there, I work at the Natural History Museum here, but there are many other uh, museums, uh, including the Air and Space Museum, uh, which some people may know from the collection of um, spacecraft that, that um, we hold in trust for uh, the US government. Um, and the Natural History Museum ha is the largest natural history museum on the planet. We have uh, nearly 150 million specimens in the collections um, that ranks um, among the most uh, of any natural history museum in, in the world. Uh, but it's not just the collections we have. Um, we have about 8 million visitors a year 
And I think that gets at the idea of communication. We have a huge public facing responsibility. What are the exhibits that we share? What kind of information do we want to um, present to the public? And what are the messages we hope people will take away? Um, we know from looking at visitor statistics that about 50% of the visitors who come to the museum, it's their first time. And um, in many cases, they may not come back for a long, long time. Uh, it may be their first and only time in their life. So uh, if you have that kind of audience um, expectation, uh, they're here in Washington, D.C., which is the capital of the country, uh, they expect to see something grand. Uh, and they probably expect to, to get uh, a message about what we know and how we know it clearly. So th the expectations are really high to deliver on that in our exhibits. And our exhibits only show 1%, less than 1% of our entire collections. So we, we are fortunate in that we have to be selective about what we show to the public. Um, but those decisions are important because many people will see them and sometimes it will make a, a very strong impression for the rest of their life. Uh, I think one of the big messages I see also is that public institutions serve as a way to educate people in ways that maybe they don't receive in school. And so uh, museums, and many people in this discussion represent museums, including natural history museums, um, museums represent an opportunity for informal education, education outside of the classroom. So I think that um, we have to be really careful about, or we have to give a lot of thought to the kinds of information that we want to share. Uh, the information can be very direct. I have an example here in my hands. This is an actual whale fossil that I sometimes share with uh, students. It is not a museum specimen, but it is real. It's a fossil I collected about 20 years ago, um, and there are many like it. So I, it's kind of a, an extra, a spare fossil. Uh, but it belongs to the tailbone of a fossil whale that lived about 16 million years ago. Um, there's nothing like being able to hold one of these objects in your hand because it um, very tangibly communicates, this is real, it lived a long time ago, and there's so much it can say about extinct life, past worlds, and where we're going um, collectively as a species. Um, Ilya, you asked about technology too. I think there's a lot of ways that we can use technology beyond just giving exhibits. Uh, certainly with cell phones, we have um, a lot of uh, ability to share more information. I is this a good moment for me to share my slides or should I wait uh, to share them with everybody else? Okay. Uh, I I'll, um, one of the, um, I should back up for a moment and say, um, one of the things I, one of the um, groups of organisms that I, I know um, I have special expertise are whales uh, and other marine mammals. Uh, this is an image of a humpback whale in Antarctica, Wilhelmina Bay. And this is kind of the typical image that you imagine uh, that you may see in the pages of a natural history magazine like National Geographic. Uh, and several moments after this photo, this individual whale came to the surface on our boat. I had a GoPro on my head and was able to collect this image. Uh, what this says to me as a scientist on board this research boat where we were trying to place a tag on the back of these whales to study them, they're large, they're, they live very big lives, and they're inaccessible. They live in the water almost 99% of their lives, except when they come to the surface to breathe. So there's a lot of challenges with knowing about these organisms. And if we're lucky, we can sometimes find traces of how they came to be. And that's, that's, uh, those are the questions I wanna know about. How did they evolve? Where did they come from? And then what is their future on a very rapidly changing planet, our planet, and especially right now? Um, so uh, these questions have taken me all around the world as a researcher. Um, and we all bring this information back to one place here at the Natural History Museum, where in our exhibits, we try to present this material. Here's one example of a fossil whale, a little bit older than this one. Um, so this tailbone would fit in all the way down on the backbone of this animal. This is a 40 million year old fossil whale that is kind of halfway in between 
the way that whales used to be living on land, which is a very important fact for many people to realize, whales didn't always live in the water. They once lived on land, and their fossil record tells us that, tells us information we wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, and it also documents the changes, what happens to their skeleton, and what we infer must happen to their lives over the course of about 50 million years of geologic time. Um, museum exhibits are great because you show the real thing, or if you're able to go into a classroom, you can give individuals the opportunity to, to touch the uh, objects. But uh, these objects all come from the world out, out there. And um, I think that's a really important aspect of communicating. We want to be able to tell the story of how we know something. And how we know, for a scientist, is the story of discovery, is how we figure out information about the natural world. Uh, in this case, this is an image of a fossil whale graveyard in the Atacama of Chile in South America. Right along the Pan American Highway, dozens and dozens of fossil whales were found. And what's really neat is that uh, this is a good example of using technology to communicate scientific discovery. If you look at the whales that are in the foreground, um, they look a lot like these three right here. I'm trying to get the image just about right. This is a 3D print, and obviously it's much smaller than the whales that are uh, as they once were. Their skeletons were removed from the site, but we were able to capture a digital image and create 3D model. Uh, and this was a really important for answering the scientific questions about this site, but it also creates information much farther along for anybody to access because these 3D models are available online or if you're able to make a 3D print at home, uh, this is a little more expensive 3D print, but if you have one of those machines, you're able to do it. Now, not everybody has a 3D print, but a lot of people have access, most people have access, if you're listening to this right now, through the internet. So you can actually use your phone if you want and um, take an image, uh, put, there's a QR code in the corner, uh, and most cell phones should be able to pick that up and send you to a website uh, where you'll then be able to interact with this 3D model. And you can maneuver it and change it and look at all the information as we felt, saw it in the field. This is a snapshot of scientific discovery right before us. And I think that's um, one of the ways that we can have technology communicate the stories of science. Um, and it's very hard to do this in the act, that is to say, while we're doing the science. But I think after we figure a story out, if we're careful about how we collect information, uh, this is a great way to share what we know. And it's also a way to share that information with people who may not be able to come to the museum physically and we are all not able to come to the museum right now because of the pandemic. So um, just as a last note, because I think my time is probably up, um, I wanted to share, share uh, that I have a Russian version of my book that I, where I tried to collect all these stories and write them for uh, a popular audience um, to better explain how we know what we know about uh, the specialty, the group that I specialize in, whales. So that's it for my side about well, my thoughts about communicating science, at least for now. Thank you ever so much for such a interesting report. You can, we can, you can see a true enthusiast. Now I'd like to ask the Anna Klukina about interaction with the public, how it works at your museum, Ms. Klukina. Thank you so much. I'll not wait for my presentation to appear right on the screen because I want our conversation to be more specific. Uh, what I would like to say, everything is pretty simple because the main mission of our museum is exactly by offering our expositions, by issuing our publications and by running our programs to um, d distribute and to talk about uh, modern science, modern biology. We are there to popularize science. The Darwin Museum is the only museum in the world where the full of our exposition is about the theory of evolution. You know, showing all the issues of synthetic evolutionary theory in just one exposition is quite a task, I should say. When we structured it, we wanted it to be clear and understandable for everyone, from 
school boys and girls to scientists and biologists. That's why we are basing ourselves on four levels or pillars of communication. The first one is just visual. You look at a nice picture, you look at nice animals, um, you might not even think about their names and their origin. Second, uh, explanation, the second pillar. And you can read the labels behind and below every object and read who are these guys. Third, it's uh, a more detailed, more thorough explanation when processes are added to just labels. And that's why we have schematics, we have diagrams that are more explanatory. But the fourth level, the deepest one, the fourth pillar, where you get a lot of information, that's already a detailed description, very scientific views on one specific issues and references to different scientists. And of course, you can find that level or that pillar in our info boards and uh, um, other types of computerized uh, expositions. But we've also uh, considered of making our exposition uh, more applicable for kids and more likable for kids. That's why we have kids' labels. And also we print QR codes. And by placing your phone towards that QR code, you'll be able to hear the sounds of nature, to hear how different animals roar and uh, uh, whatnot. And of course, we want to interact. Uh, we want our exposition to be interactive. And that's why we have lots of interactive objects and items and uh, even systems inside the venue. But to make you familiar, to make you more uh, familiar with the exposition, to make it more interactive, we also use uh, 3D and VR technologies like that. And also, each room in our museum has uh, training guides. We have 32 such training guides, and each audience, each age has its own book to read. So um, you can open the book and see questions to different things. And when you are touring the exposition, you're not just uh, looking around but you're also trying to answer all those questions. Again, to make it more interactive, we have a special path or a journey that we call uh, make a journey through evolution. And once again, um, the visitors are tasked with answering various questions, and they can get a feedback right away whether they were right or wrong in answering those questions. We also have our own multimedia center, which is called uh, Learn Yourself and Learn the World Around You. Um, it's a huge complex, and once again, it's uh, suitable for everyone, uh, small or big, and young and old. And um, visitors of all ages are welcome, and they can get to learn various specificities of nature. And what's also quite popular in our museum, it's yet another educational center called Eco Moscow. And here you can once again have a look at our collections. You can play around, and you can get a 360 degrees view of um, natural world. Moreover, all of our exhibitions at the Darwin Museum, apart from the artistic ones, um, serve a, as a communication tool for science. For example, this October we're simultaneously we've been simultaneously running three exhibitions to make science once again great again. Here's, for example, an exposition we called an ear. It's one of the whole series of expositions like that about the human body. Before that, we had a solo exhibition for just the eyes, then the brain. Now, the traumas of the past or the injuries of the past. That's quite an interesting exhibition, and it's becoming pretty popular. It's all about how ancient people would uh, uh, treat and uh, treat themselves and what kind of uh, medical devices they had. And there's another exhibition, uh, the members evolution, we call it. Uh, we're showing what kind of members members are needed by a human um, uh, or an animal to run, to jump, to sail, to swim, and etc. Apart from that, uh, on an annual basis, we have exhibitions that are dedicated to specific dates, for example, birthdays of amazing scientists and scholars whose names are long forgotten by some. And there is one exhibition that's all about 175 years anniversary of a famous Russian scientist, Mechnikov. We host about 60 exhibitions in a year, so we can show uh, almost 
uh, everything we can. I mean, different types of communications are being used. What's also quite popular uh, is a YouTube channel of our museum. On a daily basis, sometimes several times a week, we post uh, videos, interviews with our scientific workers and museum workers, and they talk about exhibitions and artifacts. And we do it in a more interactive way so that the chat function is used and the visitors can talk to each other as well. Of course, uh, doing theme holidays, it's a nice way of making a dive into a specific exhibition. For example, we organize the day of the war of water, the day of birds, or the day of animals, and we have lots of quizzes, lectures, documentary movies shown during such holidays. People get together, mingle, and talk with each other. Um, for that to be interesting, we give like uh, joking passports uh, or driving license for a bird or an animal, and etc. For kids, and of course, for more enlightened audience, we host lectures and seminars and workshops, meaning that. Everything we do is a, a way of communicating science to the public. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so very much. It's been very interesting. And I would like to turn to um, yet another speaker of ours, uh, Vipke Rosig, please. Ms. Vipke. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation mm -hmm. and the yeah, introduction. I'm very pleased to mm -hmm. be here, even though I would love to be uh, with you in St. Petersburg. I'm streaming live from my home in Berlin right now, as we are all in, in our home offices right now. So, um, yes, uh, I'm from the Natural History Museum, Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Um, we are uh, yeah, one of the largest museums in, in, uh, in Germany and Europe. We have uh, more than 700,000 visitors, 30 million objects. But And uh, I consider us not only a space for education, which is, of course, as a very important space for that, but also a space for interaction and personal encounters. So um, I'm going to talk, uh, give you a short overview on how the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, uh, as a research museum, um, has developed its concept for science communication in the exhibitions, education, and programming on dialogue and participation between science and uh, the public. And uh, yeah, we have many programs where science communicators translate scientific processes. But in my presentation, I will focus on the direct interactions between scientists and, um, and the public. So I will give you an impression of our museum right now. So I hope this is working. <laughs> hope you can see my slides now. Okay. So, um, okay. So yeah, the Museum for Naturkunde is a research museum and part of the Leibniz Association. Um, it's uh, the Leibniz Institute for Evolution and Biodiversity Research, and half of the staff approximately is working in research. But of course, we are also a museum and uh, one of the biggest natural history collections in Europe. And uh, we have the, which is origin in the Prussian Kingdom and the Humboldt University. So uh, the museum was actually built in the end of the 19th century as a daylight museum with the idea to open up scientific collections to the public and to the scientific community. And, uh, but with the new museum idea that searched in, uh, that came up in the UK in the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century, um, the museum was actually opened with the spatial separation between an educational ed exhibition and the scientific collection more in the back of the building. Um, and when the museum for Naturkunde now decided to go back at the goal, opening the collections to the public shown scientific processes. It's kind of going basically back to the roots, back to how the building was actually planned with these huge windows and the architecture. This is just to have an impression of how it looks like. So um, to give you a short overview of a, a how our way towards an open integrated research museum, um, we, uh, since our reopening of parts of the exhibition in the beginning of this century, 
the focus has been laid on authentic communication of science done at, in our institution and the collection that we actually have. So uh, the, the exhibitions have been developed together with the scientists who work in our institution and we only show objects that are part of our collection um, with some uh, exceptions, of course. So on the photo of the right, you can see the, our alcohol collection, wet collection, um, that is shown as a real scientific collection without much explaining information in it. Uh, it is in use, so visitors can see inside how researchers use it um, for uh, looking for species or enter the collection for maintenance work, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, and then the next step in our journey, kind of, um, the exhibition on the T-Rex skeleton called Tristan, which is right now um, shown at the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen, uh, took the communication another step towards dialogue in showing processes of science as a question-driven process and giving scientists a voice uh, as they explain their own research and their questions in holograms all around the skeleton, as we can see on the right of the picture. And um, yeah, since 2018, more or less, we are making processes visible to the public that are usually behind the scenes. So on the right, you can see the so-called open planning lab uh, of our exhibition department, uh, where I work as well. And uh, we plan exhibitions, programs, and give the visitors insight into these processes. We open our doors, there are screens that show uh, what we are doing, but we also invite uh, the visitors in for trials, mock-ups, for uh, focus groups, for discussions. And parallel to this, we are digitizing our collection like many institutions now do, and uh, we show this process um, in, a, in a gallery, basically. And uh, the, our colleagues are working there. So we, are they are all, we strive to show the authentic, authenticity of scientific processes. So we do not stage only the interesting parts of the work, but our colleagues also do their Excel sheets, our file reports and sit in front of the computer. So the whole science scientific process is shown there. And of course, there's explanatory material there showing our collections, the digitization process, et cetera. So, um, so, and then uh, we wanted to take this even a little bit further and in uh, our exhibition artifacts uh, in cooperation with the Joint Research Center of the EU Commission, we uh, asked scientists to come into our exhibition and talk about their own research. And uh, we described our idea to the colleagues and they were a little bit reluctant at first. So a little bit afraid what questions might come, how would that go? Uh, there's not much predictability if you ask visitors to just come in uh, and drop in and, and ask questions. Uh, so we did some trials on that. And um, in the end, which was really nice, all the scientists who participated in our trials, they told us, no, we want that exactly like you did it. That's really great. So we don't, don't need questions beforehand. That's fine. We are going to be there and just talk to the audience. We did it as a drop-in session. So uh, people came for the lessons, uh, for, the, for the sessions because they, they heard of it. But most of the people um, coming to the sessions were actually visitors to the galleries who didn't know what was going on and then just dropped in and found a scientist talking about their own research. So, and, um, so the next step, um, we took it into a permanent um, way of communicating. And this is the experimental field for participation and open science. Uh, it is what I am doing right now. So I conceptualized and lead this part of our museum right now. Uh, it was developed from a co-creation process uh, with colleagues from all part of the institution and with visitors. And uh, yeah, the results were more or less that they all wanted a cozy room inside the galleries where they could uh, go into an exchange between science and visitors. So uh, what we created, uh, you can see that here is uh, a living room and a kitchen-like area because we figured out this is what um, where people can mostly talk to each other, uh, get engaged in discussions uh, when they are at home. So they find they re can relate to that. They don't get, don't get lost in that space. Um, and yeah, 
И когда мы запустили эксперименты, мы делали это как... как... Sorry, I got the interpreter in Russian now. Sorry, spoken to the wrong channel. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, we launched the experimental field as a testing ground for new ways of interacting uh, with the public uh, for scientific uh, science communication and um, wanted to find out some best practices and promote participation and dialogue. And uh, from, from the beginning, I had the task to evaluate all the formats and develop these best practices and uh, communicate about that. So in the conceptualization of the experimental field, um, I defined four goals for the space. So one is to create direct encounters between science and public. Uh, the second is to allow multi-perspectivity and feed the new perspectives back into our institution. Third was to create a space for exchange and joint development in science. And uh, the last one to put new dialogue oriented forms into practice and give young researchers the possibility to try themselves out and try out new forms of co communication or just simply try out how to engage about their research topics. So um, I would like to present just really uh, some few examples of what we are doing so you get an impression um, and then you can find maybe on our webpage some more information on these formats. So uh, in the direct encounters uh, includes a wide range of formats uh, from science coffee tables we do in the museum right now digitally uh, to a um, science variety show that just had its premiere last weekend um, and you can see still on, uh, in, on YouTube and uh, to live talks where scientists talk about their topic but it's then opened uh, into a discussion. And um, yeah, all these formats emphasize the direct interaction in, in dialogue on eye level between scientists and visitors. So the, um, with the multi-perspectivity, um, we really want to gain different and new perspectives to the research and the collection of our museum by inviting the, these different uh, new groups of people who share their expertises and interests and perspectives with us. So to allow this, we create different kind of workshops uh, that focus on certain skills and interests um, like creative writing or photography or comic uh, drawing. And the participants are given special insights into uh, either a collection or a research topic in our institution. And uh, then they are accompanied in their creative process by experienced trainers and experts in writing, photography, etc. And the results of these, this process are fed back into the institution. Um, for example, we just published uh, some of the photo photos that were made in these workshops uh, or text from the writing workshops and, present, and we present that regularly on summer reading nights, etc. So, and uh, to come to the third um, goal we have, we want to provide a space for exchange. So uh, the most known ex example for that is probably our cooperation with the Fridays for Future uh, movement in Berlin, uh, where we, before the pandemic, these Fridays for Future uh, movement of mainly young people requesting a more ambitious climate policy, held uh, their protests very close to our building. So uh, we invited them to come into our building after their protests and to discuss with scientists about uh, the topics they are interested in. So um, from starting with a large forum where you see the pictures and with many different scientists talking to the young people who came there to discuss all, all kind of topics, uh, we came to uh, together with this, this group, we came to a process of workshops to uh, topics they were interested in, mainly on climate change, biodiversity loss, energy transition. And uh, for this, the museum cooperated with different uh, science institutions in and around Berlin, because we focus on biodiversity research. And so the climate change and energy transition were covered by other institutions. So last but not least, uh, our goal is to evaluate what we are doing and educate young scholars on how to communicate directly with the public. Uh, and we deeply believe that every scientist can do that and learn that. And uh, for this, um, we also uh, right now building up uh, together with the Humboldt University, a Berlin School of Public Engagement. Uh, but uh, And uh, one focus will also be these direct exchanges between science and the public. Yeah, so uh, 
sip that. So um, kind of my message is, yes, we, we really need translators, journalists and moderators in science communication and many formats uh, of communication benefit massively from this translation process. But uh, scientists, as well as the public, uh, really benefit a lot from direct interactions, participatory processes, and uh, exchange on eye level. And science, I think science really needs these manifold perspectives, and uh, the society needs uh, the experience of being part and uh, being um, uh, able to um, benefit to research with their own expertise. So I see my role here more as a host and uh, to bring these conversations and joint development processes on and the museum as a space to do that. And right now with the change with the uh, pandemic, it's kind of the technology is a really important uh, way of doing that using all kinds of digital meetings and uh, software to engage with the public and uh, with the advantage to reach a broader audience than we ever did before, uh, where we just had Berliners and tourists coming to Berlin. Um, so it's uh, actually a great advantage. So yeah, thank you. Ripke, thank you so much. It's nice to hear that journalists and moderators are really needed. Uh, not everybody feels that. Uh, at least in Russia today. Um, now, I would like to, um, Vyacheslav Klementev, to talk about uh, what is happening in your museum, the lectures. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Thank you, thank you. Ilya, you said a great thing at the start, that scientific communication is transfer of scientific knowledge from a professional to a non-professional. We call it, we approach it in the same way. Uh, uh, and the entire museum is a scientific communicator. A museum as an institution is a communicator because, you know, in other words, in a scientific museum, and in a natural museum, you can't uh, approach it otherwise because if people come in with different level of preparation and like Nick said before, half those people come here, for, or if not more, come here for the first time and the value of a unique visit gives us a responsibility that we approach a person maybe once and in the scientific field we have to put him in. I'm going to turn my presentation on. Here's a museum. We're right here in the, on the base of a huge monument called uh, Rhythm of Cosmos, and last year we did a reconstruction of this museum. Uh, here it's, you know, how everything started. 80% things here are authentic. There's Bilka and Strelka, two of the most famous dogs that ever lived, that made it back from space and foreshadowed the era of piloted ships. And you got the space suit and the replica of the first artificial Sputnik. And I always feel so sorry for our guests who come and don't take the tour and don't use the museum communicator in its most direct of fashions when you do it with the person. Because sure, you know, uh, going through a technical museum unprepared is very, is very complex. Look at this, this diva, and, and uh, I recently thought, what's the difference between a scientific museum and an artistic museum? And then I figured just recently that the artifacts, that the amazing things that are in the, art, in the artistic museums, the masterpieces were created by the masters of the past for them to be watched and looked at centuries later. Our 
things, our collection items have been made to for them to fulfill a certain task. You know, the, I'm, I'm sure you'll understand me. They don't have the retroactiveness uh, that the museum item has. Like this device, you know, isn't going to attract your attention among others before methods of scientific communications are going to tell you that this is this is this is uh, this is a uh, SAS, the, si the system uh, of emergency rescue, SER, that's been uh, designed by the Russian scientist. It worked three times. It saved uh, and, it, and it saved pilots three times. And the last time, hopefully the very last time, happened two years ago. And all of the space, uh, all of the astronauts have been saved. But this must be communicated. Oh, look at this, this device. 99% of you know, I mean, people ask me what this is. No one's gonna, most people are not gonna say what it is. It's a camera. It's a camera with a roll of film in it. That's been created to be used at the salute station. And it's very interesting. And, and this bioprinter, bioprinter that's used today at the International Space Station uh, to uh, print living organs. And, you know, it's been tested and they show results so that uh, for future flights to Mars, and all of this must be communicated, must be communicated simple, simply through texts, because, you know, people don't read long texts. They don't, they don't want, they can't, it's young people now. And and those who make those tickets, those who, you know, work with the audiences. This is all scientific communication. Another thought, a very important one, I think. Scientific communicator for us is not just a tour guide. It's the astronauts themselves who are, you know, incredibly prepared. They learn to talk about why do you have to go to space in an interesting fashion, what's happening in the National Space Space Station right now. So meeting with astronauts for now is incredible. You know, online, offline, it always gathers a lot of people. And a thought, a very important thought, that the scientific communicator that must combine the possibility, you know, to be, to know the topic, the love for the subject, the foreign languages, and some journalist or polytechnical education. It can be all, all and any of it, but it's something similar to an art mediator in an artistic museum. If a mediator gets between the, the complicated painting and a visitor, a scientific communicator through question and answer leads a person from this ignorance to this informativeness and this organization of communication around an item, a sophisticated one, but an interesting one, is the task of that person who is the scientific communicator. How is it different from just a tour guide? I understand in the following way. A tour guide follows a route and renders in an interesting fashion the information and answers the questions, whereas a scientific communicator follows a route because he or she feels they are prepared. They have the knowledge, the, um, the skills they can use the time they can build the entire lecture in just one hall because they understand that's what it, that's what it takes. So basically that's that's what I wanted to say for, for Thank you. Very interesting. And now I want Mikko to say a few words. Thank you. Start sharing my screen. Do you see my screen? I hope you do. Uh, Eureka, the Finnish Science yes, Center, sure. does not have collections. Yes. So obviously, we don't start from the specimen, but we start from the audience. And nowadays, we frame our objective as 
building the science capital of our society. And mostly we through it through interactive multisensory museum experiences. We are, of course, part of a bigger, larger movement globally. There are nowadays more than 3,000 science centers in the world in more than 90 countries visited by 350 million people. And uh, as was referred earlier, uh, there's formal learning in schools and universities, and then there is informal learning. But at Heureka, we wish to take the third path. We don't want to call ourselves by a name which is a negation of formal learning. We prefer to grasp the true spirit of the learning that happens in our institution, which is free choice learning. People come here to spend meaningful time. So it's not about to test or not to test, but it's about spend meaningful time with your near ones. So on an average, a human being spends only some 5% in so-called formal learning, and 95% of our time happens elsewhere. And this is where our work is, whether it's in, inside the science center or outreach activity or online activity, because we can learn everywhere all the time. And in the old days, there was criticism towards science centers saying that we see that they are having fun, but do they learn anything? And now the good news is that nowadays we do know that learning happens in science centers and science museums. We know that our audiences learn facts and skills, but also they become aware of topics or they find new perspectives to something that they already knew. And they get motivated, they get interested, and beyond the visit, they do go on and explore. And last but not least, there is a very important aspect of learning, which is the social learning. Because visiting a museum, in our case, at Heureka, more than 99% of the cases, it's a social experience. Only less than 1% come to visit us alone. So this means that when we build our experiences and the learning environment, we should take onto account the fact that people are sharing social time together. They can learn from each other, but they are also learning about each other. So they be become uh, subjects to a new situation and uh, they can thus find themselves and find about each other new things. So when we start from the visitor, we are of course asking why are they coming to visit us? And we understand that not everybody is there driven by the curiosity that I want to learn. Some of them are offering this for another person, like facilitating as a parent, as a friend, as a partner, as a teacher. There are also those who are seeking for wow experiences. There are those who are professionals or having maybe some field of science as a hobby. Or there might be just people who are coming to have a relaxed time as a counterpart to something that they routinely do in their daily work or, or school or, or, or wherever. And we should, in a way, acknowledge that all these motivations to visit us are, are great. We are not to define uh, what should be the way. Sorry, now my screen died. So probably I have to carry on by without my, oh, now I find my slides again, good. So uh, when we are looking at an ideal learning environment, we should build with four C letter words. We should offer the audience a choice uh, so that we are not just bombarding one message. We should also offer them control over their experience so that they are not overwhelmed by what we are doing. They should have a good feeling about what they are doing. It should be comfortable, but then on the other hand, it should be challenging enough. So this is a very thin balance, how to organize so that different people of different ages and, and different backgrounds can have such an experience. But if we are successful, people really can create a flow feeling uh, in a museum. Like Mihaly, Csikszent Mihaly, the famous psychologist has defined this incredibly wonderful feeling when you don't even feel tired, you don't feel thirsty, you don't feel hungry because you want to carry on your nice experience. 
science centers and science museums are very wonderful places for such experiences. And I would summarize um, what is a good experience in a museum. Uh, and there are three very important factors. First of all, it's relevance. Whatever we are offering should be relevant to the audience. So we should not define the agenda. We should build the agenda with our audiences. Then we should also have the element of emotion. It's not only about facts. It is also about how I feel about it. And then thirdly, there should be dialogue. We shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, not be a one-way street. We should be in a dialogue mode so that the people who visit and come to us, that they can leave a trace, they can leave a mark, so that our museum is different after their visit. And we listen to them and we exchange with them. So our main mission is really to build the science capital of our society. And I don't know if you are familiar with the term science capital, but it was introduced five years ago by Queen's, uh, King's College in London, by the researchers who were looking at the Pierre Bourdieu social capital concept, and then taking the sub-concept of science capital. And that is like the sum of all the science-related knowledge, attitudes, experiences, and resources one might have. And if you look at the science capital of a person, I think that inspires us who work in this field as science communicators to do a better job. We understand that what we have been doing is great, but it's only a partial solution. We should be even more interested in what is on in people's minds in order to really connect and build bridges and offer a platform for meaningful encounters and meaningful learning. So thank you for your attention. I would be willing to discuss this further. Thank you so very much. We could see that. Well, I could feel that you're a great enthusiast of scientific communication. You created a huge museum, and as far as I understand, it doesn't have an exposition as such, but it has an experience. Is that correct? I'm also, um, I apologize. Um, uh, I apologize to uh, all the scientists, and here I have a very naive question, because I don't always have a chance to talk to professional museum experts and museum workers. And there's a question that I would like to ask you. Every time I think about a museum, every time I uh, have it in my mind as a scientific organization, it seems to me that a museum should have neither expositions nor the visitors, like in Mika's case, where you don't have the real exposition or the, um, the items. Uh, why I think like that? Because any museum is an archive, uh, and not the archive of documents, but the archive of things that have to be collected, they have to be stored, and they have to be researched. And they have to be preserved to future generations of researchers for those who will come again with new methods, new research tools, and new research approaches. That's the way I see, well, uh, a scientific mission of a museum. And when we try to add some additional functions on top of that, such as an educational function or an entertainment function or a popularization function, don't you think that by doing so, by adding all those layers on top, we prohibit the museum to perform its main scientific function. Don't you think that there's going to be an additional burden that will kill or will slow down the scientific progress? It might have been much easier, and I'm just um, thinking about that out loud, uh, to separate a museum from pop uh, from uh, promotional projects or scientific promotional projects. Just imagine the following situation. You have physics working in an institute or in a lab, and then every day a crowd rushes into, la into the lab with their dirty feet and asking questions, uh, well, nagging, and the scientists always have to get distracted and to answer those questions, uh, to do the enlightenment job, and so on and so forth. Whereas uh, this objective can be performed by a different sort of an expert, um, like a science uh, promoter who doesn't do scientific job, who knows how to talk to people. Should we differentiate these two functions? Should we split them? 
the museum function and the communication function. Does anyone want to answer that question? I can start if you want. Yes, please, please, for sure. That's what all uh, natural museums started doing 300 years ago, 400 years ago. They were just collecting and storing. Now, well, you, what you're saying is right, that every scientific museum, natural museum, has a fourth function to present, to communicate, to show. And this to present and to show can be divided into entertaining, into scientific lectures or scientific talks, and so on and so forth. Any museum, especially the Smithsonian Museum, which uh, we've heard already, they store colossal collections not to show. They're only showing a tip of an iceberg, the most interesting, the most attractive, the most lucrative, and the most and, and the sweetest things. What their museum is showing, it's showing for social mission. You see, it's answering a question. And what for? Uh, that's where it all started from. Remember Kunstkamera in St. Pete, uh, the first natural museum? Originally it was banned from visiting by the public. That's it. I don't want to take too much time. I don't want to elaborate, but of course I have lots of other ideas. Yeah, you've mentioned Smithsonian Institute, so Nick, what do you think? Uh, do you think that uh, this educational entertainment and promoting function of museums, which you also do, which you also perform as well, uh, don't you think it's a barrier to scientific research? Don't you think it takes a lot of time from you, more time than you pr probably wanted to spend on it? So um, these are great questions. Uh, I would say one, right now I am in a part of the museum that is entirely off limits to the public. Um, this is a research area. These are the wings outside of the actual exhibit space. And you saw in the um, Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin that um, they're really trying to innovate spaces where people can gather to examine objects, but also to exchange ideas. Um, so I think that in, um, as uh, Anna was, was mentioning, I think that uh, most modern museums understand that you really don't want members of the public coming into your collection spaces because those are areas that, like you said, are, are archives. We are, Our job as people who work at the archives is to protect them, to preserve them, so that outside of our lifetimes, somebody we will never meet will eventually be able to look at the objects and study them. And like you said, Ilya, very well, ask new questions about it, bring new approaches, bring new perspectives. Um, I always like to think that museums 300 years ago, 200 years ago, even 100 years ago, could not have imagined how important they would be because of the scale of accelerated human change. We are modifying the planet so rapidly that those past worlds are rapidly going extinct before our eyes. We are losing the evidence of how the world once was. So if we want to know where we're going, what um, future conditions on this planet will be like, we will need museums like this one, and we will need these collections to be able to say something about the future of biodiversity and the future of ourselves on this planet. Um, I think So I think that that separation is good for the long-term preservation of the collections. Um, but People are, you know, at the core of the museum, we have these collections, but people are their caretakers and people change through time. Uh, and what we, the responsibilities that we give to people change. As you said, um, my responsibility is a researcher, but part of my job evaluation is actually how to communicate it. Uh, and I, I think that's really important because um, fundamentally I feel gratified, my, my happiness in my job is a function not just of research productivity, of publishing papers and doing, doing, the, doing the science, but also sharing it and making sure that I'm doing the best job possible communicating it. Um, because I feel um, obligated as a public servant, and two, if it's joyful to be able to be able to um, have somebody understand in a very concrete way what it is that you spend your time doing. Can I uh, jump in? Uh -huh. Vipki, you want to say something, right? Oh, Vipki, you want to add something, right? Yes, uh, 
Uh, I just wanted to add that with my call for more direct uh, interactions and uh, of course, um, this, this is something you have to weigh. So it's, it's obviously mm -hmm. not that all scientists now are going to spend 100% of their work time in the exhibitions talking to people. So that would end their scientific career. But uh, I think uh, there are new, there are a lot of new ideas and new ways of opening up scientific processes uh, beyond uh, in, uh, uh, translation and education process. So giving insights into the real processes happening that can be via digitization, for example, possibilities of really viewing the collections without having hundreds of people walking through it all the time. And uh, the other uh, is that, um, that we are trying to develop a format to show that science can actually really benefit from these interactions as well. So science can get better by, by um, incorporating new perspectives, new ideas, new expertises that come from outside science. And the museum might be a space where this can happen, where really these interactions happen, where ideas can come up in a new group, a new a way of talking. So, uh, but it's of course not that these scientists are supposed to be there all day long. And we have a lot of formats, educational form for school groups, etc., that are done by professional communicators, not by the scientists themselves, uh, or the, the guided tours through our museum. So this is not what our researchers uh, usually do. But uh, if they give an input, they, they talk about their own research and they try to, to get, grasp as many perspectives as they get. So I think it's a way of weighing both sides. One is the translator, the science communicator, the journalist and uh, function. And the other one is the scientist directly communicating and showing their processes. And it's, it has to be balanced in a way. May I add two points? Вячеслав, я так понимаю, вы хотите... Ага, хорошо, давайте. Мика. Мика, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, um, just about the definition of a museum, we all start thinking of objects and specimens. But actually, museum is about heritage. And it's not only the tangible heritage, but it's also the intangible heritage. And as a science center, we feel that our intangible heritage is the methodology of science, the research, the questioning. And even though we wouldn't have physical collections to touch or, or to see, we do have this intangible heritage of science to uh, perform when we do our exhibitions. Then, on the other hand side, we also can do citizen science. And uh, we, for example, one kilometer upstream, the river that flows by the science center, we organize community archaeology. We have a Neolithic dwelling site. And then we can invite our visitors to do the excavations with the archaeologist, which is like a direct way of connecting to the past 5,000 years ago. And the other day, we also had a project with forensic psychologists to uh, make a test track for uh, testing the power of eyewitnessing. And this is, there will be a link now to Russian soon. Uh, our visitors were the test persons to try to identify a person from a distance, like you would be an eyewitness for a crime scene. And then uh, the researchers were really happy because by collecting the data from our visitors, they could get children, youth, adults, seniors, all ages. Typically, the researchers only get students because they are doing it at the campus. So when they were presenting their summary of the findings, it uh, actually turned out that the Russian saying lies like an eyewitness is true. <laughs> we are very unreliable as eyewitnesses. So a science center without collections can also be, in a way, a direct connection between researchers mm -hmm. and the audience who can participate in the research. So this is also one option that, that we can do. Thank you. 
Vyacheslav, now you wanted to add something, right? See, today my colleagues mentioned it a few times um, by saying the word education. Nick was talking about the informal education. Mika was talking about the informal education. That you know, that's that's a lifelong education. Whereas we are the followers of very formal education. So we believe that that it's an education that each one of us went through in school and in, in the university. And in my humble opinion, separating a museum from this formal education would be a crime, because I believe the museums have been imagined as the location of a transfer of an invaluable experience, the experience of at least not repeating the mistakes of the past. I remember, well, I don't remember, I know how Victoria and Albert Museum was, was founded in England. And you know what I'm saying, right? I'm sorry that I'm mentioning this, but it, but it's my hero, like like, my, like Anna's. I rem remember quotes the founder of the Darwin's Museum uh, that he started in education, and the museum stemmed out of the education process and his personal collection, like Sergei Korolev, the ch the, the chief engineer of Russian astronautic industry, how he would say, despite being super busy, he'd say, one, one should go to space and a copy should go to the museum. So the museum and education, they go hand in hand, they're compatible. So, you know, there's all these lessons that either the teachers do in our museum or our museum teachers do for kids. So talking about reactive movement in physics is a whole almost simple if we're doing it in a museum with a uh, rocket in front of us than just using pictures at school. So education and museum are one for me. So if I understand you correctly, you believe it is important to integrate a museum into a regular curriculum. School, university, community college, whatever. Whereas Nico believes that it should be a separate system that targets people who aren't necessarily getting a task of getting a new education, but just to, re to receive a new knowledge whilst, whilst being entertained. Mika, do I understand you correctly? So it's, it's a special mean of broadcasting knowledge to the people that doesn't necessarily create conscious effort. It can be subconscious. It's a hypnopedia when a person go, comes in to be entertained and he, you know, some knowledge is smuggled in. Well, uh, that's part of the picture, sure, because we should be open to all kinds of visitors. But definitely, we are not saying no to school groups. 20% uh, of our visitors are still school groups with their teachers. So we are like, happy to support the formal education but we are supplementing it with our methods that are quite different from what is done in school. Is there a way to measure this, uh, the efficiency of this informal approach? Uh, is there, uh, are there number, numbers that, that, you, that you can run for it? Like, you know, a person studies, uh, like, you know, quantifying it or, you know, like, can, can you compare what works, what doesn't, what ju what's useful, what's purely entertaining? And, uh, yeah, you know, you are a professional journalist, and it's a good thing you're trying to, you know, to clash us. But I'm sure all of the colleagues are going to support me. The thing is, there's a saying that informal approach to formal education. We all want to do education, but want to approach it informally. And museums follows the same purpose. Mika? Do you have anything to add to this? Well, yes, uh, okay, my, my favorite term is the free choice learning, which is like, in a way, taking the third road, in a way. But uh, uh, I totally, in fact, agree. Mm -hmm. It's not 
an opposite towards what is done in schools. And actually, schools nowadays can do a really good job. Maybe you know, at least in Finland, we are very proud of the PISA success we have had in comparing different school systems. So actually, I shouldn't look down at schools. I, I don't want to do that. But really, I think, think that the role of a museum or a science center can be more experimental. So we don't have to follow the curriculum very thoroughly. We can be a bit more experimental and try out new things. And this is actually what we are going now. We just got a grant for this kind of fostering science capital project. So we are actually trying to reach out for youth that might be in danger of be, be becoming marginalized. And we try to intervene in their lives in a way that maybe they could find a meaning, a more be, uh, deep meaning in their lives if they would be connected to something intellectual. But you don't do it by giving them a book in the first place. You have to, you have, to have a dialogue uh, starting from their terms and then build the road up uh, towards something which is relevant and meaningful. Thank you. So it's a, it's a therapeutical, uh, supporting the moral well-being of a nation. <laughs> Look, now I want to switch the conversation over a little bit. There is scientists and educators that work in the museums. There are attempts to, to involve them into the communication process, make them broadcast the scientific knowledge that they work in. I want to ask Vipke, how do scientists react to this communication that you mentioned? How easy it is for the scientists to communicate what is the the what what is useful that they find in it because apart from just fun what's the use for them are there any other useful traits useful features that they get and are there situations when some scientists uh, avidly talk to the public and others don't? Is there a conflict maybe when you tell a scientist, you know, you should go talk to the public and he or she doesn't want to or he or she is super excited? Um, how does it work? How do you do this? Yes, thank you for this uh, really interesting question. So, um, so one um, one thing is, of course, that we never force anyone to do that. So if someone is really reluctant to do that, uh, mm. maybe there's there are some scientists who who, does, who just simply uh, don't want to and uh, or find another way of communication. I mean, you have the peer-to-peer -peer communication. They, have, they publish things. They go to conferences, and maybe that is more their thing. So <laughs> that's okay. But uh, what we want to encourage is. Uh, to in engage as a researcher with the public uh, on an on an informal basis, on, in a in a um, direct dialogue on eye level, just talk about your own research. So uh, we have done some communication uh, classes or kind of workshops with scientists, and we usually ask them uh, to, to to talk about their work in like two or three sentences, and then we give them each uh, separated in groups and then you give each of them one task so one group is going to to uh, talk to that tell them tell their grandmother about their work and the other group is telling uh, a crush at the party and the th third one to the professor and then they all do that and uh, we make them realize that they are all natural communicators so you all know that you all can talk about the thing you really like and are passionate about to your grandmother as well as the professor and you adapt the level so you know that we are all natural communicators and just give people the 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 will to do that and the power just go out there and talk about your science and tell people about what you are doing so many of the questions our visitors usually have are about what's your daily routine what are you doing in the lab or what are you what is your question you are doing your research on so it's not it's actually very uh easy to answer for the scientists and on the other side the, the public is really interested in these processes and um then we in our formats we are going to try to take that further to focus more on this benefit for scientists so uh what we are doing is actually to to come up with different 
possibilities to interact in a meaningful way for the scientists to get um, perspectives they have not seen so far, uh, maybe in, um, in, in how to um, uh, make use of what they found out or how to uh, uh, engage with people who are interested in the subject but on a different and not, non, not that academic uh, level and um, we we are evaluating all our formats so interestingly many of the scientists who took part of it do answer that they found that either fulfilling and very interesting, but many also answer they got new perspectives, they got, they really liked the engagement of the public, they were amazed by the interest, they were, so they, they, they uh, kind of took a new inspiration to their own work. Mm -hmm. And I think in that, it is a great benefit because uh, imagine you sitting in your lab and then you have this communication environment in science where you present your papers and then they reject that and then you represent that and they reject that. So it's kind of, <laughs> it's a really different and much more rewarding situation to talk about your science and your, the work you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think that to balance these both communication processes can be really <laughs> rewarding mm -hmm. for scientists um, as well. So um, this is at least also what the feedback tells us so far. <laughs> That's great, thanks a lot. Anna, can you tell us how do your um, scientists, or uh, if you're making any attempts like that, treat uh, like talking to the public, or how do they take that co communication and conversation with the public? Let me support, uh, let me uh, second my colleagues in here. You can't force anyone. We have some curators and some uh, researchers who don't want to talk and they never knew how to talk to people, and we leave them be. There are others who love it, especially when there's a new researcher, a young researcher who comes in, starts doing collection, and uh, feels that it's great. And we have uh, YouTube stars, we have a paleontologist, a guy who really likes talking to people, who really likes talking about his job. And of course, forcing someone doesn't make any sense, doesn't produce any results. If a person wants to just research a collection and that's it, if you're going to drag him, if you want to put an, ad, uh, an administrative leverage uh, to, to push him from the dead spot, it will not happen. So I will support my colleagues. To each his own, as we say. Um, some people just don't know that they can talk, but if he tried and it doesn't work, it doesn't jump, it's better leave him alone or leave her alone. Or for example, we have an amazing researcher, an ecologist, who writes amazing dissertations and beautiful texts, but he can't speak. So we try not to let him go and talk to the public. <laughs> There's another question to you. Uh, you are putting in a lot of efforts into technical means of communication because you have your own VR room. You have attractions for kids, uh, right, that are suited for them to try and touch uh, some material stuff to get them familiar with the exposition, not just see it with their own eyes, but with all other uh, sensory uh, sen senses. Uh, you make your exhibitions talk to people. You make your items talk to people. People, and your exposition does work, it asks questions, and they need to answer, so it's an interaction. But what share of your efforts should be spent on technological gizmos and gadgets? How much attention and money and efforts have to be spent on various uh, innovative uh, devices and contraptions that um, try to uh, catch the attention and how much your effort should be spent on raising people who are going to talk to people. Actually, it's an amazing question that you're asking because we've been thinking about that uh, a lot in our museum. Getting people distracted with the new technologies, uh, make them carried away is bad, especially for a museum with classical collection. Keeping the golden middle uh, or keeping the balance is really hard. And not to turn it into a circus, not to turn your museum into glitching screens and the person is overwhelmed 
especially if you have money. I've seen museums like that, giant screens all around, and the person is now get, gets completely lost. Or he might just miss this beautiful um, uh, tailbone of a whale that our colleague here was showing with such a great care, because a lot of screens will be flashing around, distracting the attention. So a classical museum, and our position is as follows. Uh, all those technologies need to play a supportive role. They need to keep the attention. For example, we have an interactive uh, exhibit. A person stands in front of uh, a life Neanderthalian sculpture, and the Neanderthalian uh, just replicates and mirrors the person standing in front. Because this person, after a while monkeying around and turning around into the new exhibit, he would read more about that Neanderthalian and about that person who lived so many years back in the time. So it's a great way of communicating it. Nobody will ever tell you that it should be that uh, exact figure, like 5% or 10% or 50%. It's very individual for any museum, but keeping the golden middle, as we say, is really hard. Mika, what do you think how it should work? Can you say? How much, how long can you go? How far can you go in uh, in interactivity, in turning your museum into a virtual room, into a virtual circus, as Anna said, right? A place where everything's flashing and glaring, razzling, dazzling, and all your senses are being, uh, well, are working, and the person goes in, but he can't go out. And in this case, you can lose the content behind this flash mirror. There is a risk that a person can dive in completely into this dream into this technological dream, but when he comes back, he doesn't bear any knowledge. Well, you are really, you should really come over and visit us, so you would be surprised how low-tech we can be. So not necessarily uh, the interactions means technology, I mean uh, digital technology. We are very happy to provide direct dialogue with nature, I mean uh, simple exhibits that don't even use electricity, that are, are just objects. And uh, I would say that the art we are dealing with is less technological and it's more like a work of a dramaturg. I'm now to, to, talking in terms of theater. So we are making learning environments and they, there we do scenography. And then we are staging our expositions in a way that they make our visitor to become the protagonist, the one with the leading role. So the interaction is between the visitor who has the leading role and then its interactions in this environment, not just with the exhibition, but also with other people. Our inspirers, that's the word we use for guide, inspirer, and uh, other people. Actually, my favorite exhibitions are such that they build a relationship between the visitors themselves. So they place the visitor to encounter the other visitor about a topic. And uh, now you should understand that our science center is not only about natural hard sciences, but we are also looking at social sciences and humanities. So this gives us freedom to move also in these directions. But also I would say that what we are saying here about the profession, science, research, and what we should do, that uh, science is not isolated part of the society, but science is done by society for the society. And that's why our role is really to be there uh, at, as a platform and bridge people. People with people, some of them do science, some of them live their lives, <laughs> but they can be bridged and brought on the same stage. Thank you. And a fairly general question. Does a museum have room for a special scientific communicator person? There's a question that came from the social networks. Can a role of scientific communicator be played by someone who has another job, like, you know, a tour guide or research fellow, or is it like a separate role, like in a theater that Mik was describing, like a director in a theater? Vyacheslav, like in your museum, how's it done? How do you feel? Do you have a separate scientific communicator 
like someone who just, you know, renders scientific knowledge. Um, I'd say this. I think communicator isn't a person who organizes communication. It's not about, you know, making complicated things simple. It's a question of, you know, understanding what does a person know or doesn't know and organizing a communication around a topic. And this is why I compare it to a museum mediator. It's a complicated job. And, you know, these people are, you know, you can, there's so few of them. You know, some of them are volunteers, but right now they have four or five people who are not tour guides, who know the topic, who are a little bit of, you know, psych have psychological background. They know how to ask questions and know how to answer questions. And this is what I call a scientific communicator. So you do have them. You have them that can have a job description, can have a scientific communicator. Oh, no, no, well, not really. I mean, you know, we can't really put them down, they're either research fellows or, muse or, muse or museum educators, but we, we raise them up and we live through with them so they become the communicators. The last question I think we need to start wrapping up. Nick, you are an active scientist, a paleontologist, and you have a perfect idea of the level of the audience's knowledge on paleontology. You know what the audience expects from a paleontological expedition. You know you got to tell them about dinosaurs, you tell them about mammoth, you know, so on and so forth. Don't you think that a gap between uh, scientific interest, something that interests you as a scientist and what interests the public, is so enormous that you have to go down to the, pub, to the audience's level and tell them not about like awesome particularities that interest you, but instead of higher mathematics, you educate them in arithmetic. Uh, how do you feel that? Is it an is it a necessary a necessary evil, or is it? Or do you manage to render the big science through little things? I think this is a great question. Um, in the United States, people uh, call this uh, concept of um, dumbing down, that the technical information is simply too complex and requires too much expertise and training to really understand unless you've mm -hmm. done that kind of level of investigation. And on the other hand, you have um, members of the public who may, don't, who may not have much education beyond uh, primary school or secondary school, um, yet the objects in between are, the th that's what you really want to show and you want to use that as a way to explain bigger ideas, whether the idea is about um, extinction, about uh, the age of the earth, about the diversity of life, about the fact of evolution. Many messages can come out of these objects. Um, I do not think that dumbing down is is really um, it's kind of a false problem because um, your job, at least the way I see it for me, my job is a storyteller. I get to tell you various stories about these objects, and uh, a good storyteller knows what details to leave out and which ones to keep in. And uh, this is all about the narratives mm -hmm. that we use to explain how we know what we know about the world. And, um, you know, think about um, the Cosmonautic uh, Museum, where you have all these wonderful artifacts from the history of space exploration in Russia. Each one of those objects are about, as Miko said, heritage, and they are real and tangible, and they are impressionable to anyone, I think, who sees them. Uh, 
and most importantly, they tell that story. They're telling you a story. And there's many different kinds of stories. You might tell a very technical story about the fabric and how it was made or how the, the materials have changed through time. Or maybe a personal story about the dogs that were sent into space and their names and why they were given those names and um, you know the people who took care of them. That's a very human story, right? So I think the job of a storyteller is a serious one. And just to go back to another point, everybody can do this. Um, some people are better than others, but everybody can learn those skills about how to communicate. Um, yes, it would be great if we professionalized it, if people actually were employed to do that. And I think that's happening more and more in museums. Um, but for now, you have people who are largely enthusiasts, who understand how that mode of communication, telling the story, telling the story of the object um, can be adopted by many people from many different backgrounds. So do I understand you correctly, that from your point of view, a scientific communicator doesn't have to be a scientist. You can be in your museum, you can invite a person, you can invite a journalist, right? But they are good storytellers, they're good at building a narrative, and they're going to be able to play their role regardless of the fact that they're not professional scientists, they don't have a PhD. Maybe you have such examples. See, for this, for this, you need to really know your subject. It's very important. You have to know your subject. And you have to, it's not just telling a story. It's important to interpret what's happening in science today, what the academicians are doing, what the professors are doing. Nick, what's your take? Absolutely. Um, this Paul, Mr. Sergleson. I have a... Uh, I think, um, obviously, I think facts matter, and I think that... Um, People who work in public institutions are custodians of those facts. Uh, if you stop thinking that facts matter, then um, you really are just being an entertainer, right? Um, and so when you tell a story, those stories are attached to things that we know, the facts that don't change. Our interpretations change. We make new discoveries that change how we think about what those facts tell us. Um, Storyteller may evoke these ideas of fantasy and whim, but I guess I'm, my, my meaning of a storyteller is uh, really somebody who communicates in an engaging way. Um, and that's where that idea of narrative is very important. Narrative is what carries you along and keeps your attention. And um, everybody cares about narrative. Everybody cares about other people. Um, they may not be super interested in fossils, or they may not be super interested in the history of spacecraft. That's fine. But I've, uh, my uh, experience is that people do care about people. And that is a way to get people engaged with whatever you're trying to communicate. Well, thank you ever so much. We unfortunately have to start wrapping up. Thank you for this engaging conversation. I will remember this for a very long time, because it's very important when people talk to each other. Narrative is extremely important. And once again, thank you for taking your time to have this conversation with us. I hope we'll get to meet in person and on the Culture Forum in the future. Stay healthy and thank you once again.